So I'm Howard Reber. This is Annette Stanton. And uh, many of you, I think, remember her from last year, professor of psychology and psychiatry at UCLA. It's great to have you with us. Why don't we ask all of the folks who are going to be on the panel to come up and pick a spot? Um, thank you very much for being here. I think that this has been an incredibly inspiring day so far, and now we're in for a treat with talking about talking with patients, uh, survivors, and partners. Um, and I want to just take a moment to, to mention my Hirschberg Founda found, uh, Foundation funded study um, that has to do with the kind of experiences we'll be talking about now. Some of you have already taken part in this study. It's for pancreatic cancer patient survivors as well as caregivers, and that may be a husband, wife, partner, it may be a friend, it may be a uh, adult son or daughter. Uh, we are recruiting right now for that study, and it involves three, three sessions in which you, we ask you lots of questions about your experience um, over just the course of two months, and, and we do provide a, a bit of comp compensation in honor of your time and, time and um, energy devoted to this study. And really, because the research is so limited on the actual experience of the disease and its treatment, um, the Hirschberg Foundation has funded this study in order to better characterize what this is like for people, both the tough stuff and the positive things. And so that's our study, and we would love to have you. There are brochures outside, and my wonderful PhD student, Megan, is here. Oh, across the room right here, and she also has uh, brochures, and I think we'll do a sign-up sheet uh, for anybody. If you have your name and email or phone number, we'd love to be able to contact you. Um, I also want to mention Dr. Doring's study. Is Dr. Doring still here? She, mu she must not be here. She's also funded, of course, by the foundation, and they are also doing a study for patients and caregivers. Um, particularly who are having trouble um, coping with the disease. So that's enough for that. This is the important part. Um, I want to introduce our wonderful panel of both survivors and caregivers. Um, we have asked everyone to say, each of our panelists today, to say a bit about their experience, their diagnosis, and their experience with the disease. Um, and then we'll open it up. This is a time for us. And so we'll open it up to your questions. Uh, Dr. Reber and I may pose questions if, uh, if we need to, but we're very open to questions from the panel. So I want to start out, perhaps Lee, would you like to, would you like to begin? Well, <laughs> indeed. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Now I know what it's like to accept an Academy Award. <laughs> 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 And uh, I'd like to start by saying that uh, I, I was diagnosed in 2000, and the short story I will tell will just kind of tell all of us how far things have come since then. Uh, and as I say, uh, it, was, it was 2000, I became jaundiced, and I went to my, my uh, general practitioner, and he decided uh, that it was probably hepatitis. They did tests. I was sent to a gastroenterologist. Uh, he thought it was that. Then there, there were a group of gastroenterologists an MRI and uh, a number of things that were done. Uh, it took six weeks for a diagnosis. And they then referred me to an unqualified surgeon who spoke vaguely of chemotherapy. Uh, you, you can imagine myself and my wife, who is uh, my absolute caregiver and uh, saved my life. Uh, she followed up a couple of clues uh, on the computer one night, and I was really getting more and more ill. Uh, the, the, the jaundice continued. She uh, uh, again began her search. I woke up in the morning, and she had found Dr. Reber and Dr. Isakoff. And uh, they immediately, uh, Dr. Reber uh, had, had me in his office within, within two days. Uh, they, they set out a, a procedure and a, a protocol and uh, I, I signed up, and uh, it, it all seemed so overwhelming. I mean, I've got to say that uh, I wasn't sure that I was up for all of this, but I knew that Dr. Reber and Dr. Isakoff were, <laughs> so I just kind of got on board. Uh, 
So uh, the, uh, the, the first thing was uh, a resection, which unfortunately was not successful. But I think that Dr. Reber might say that in some ways it was uh, even exploratory. I, I don't know that they expected great results. Uh, I immediately began uh, the chemotherapy regime with, uh, with Dr. Isakoff. I was 24 weeks and 24 hours a day of the four substances that are, that are noted here in, the, uh, uh, in your programs. And it was uh, with a, a port cath and a pump so that I was being bathed 24 hours a day with these four chemotherapy agents. Uh, there was a, a, a little break for, for pneumonia, but <laughs> that aside, things went really quite well. Uh, at, at that point, uh, there was a second successful resection. And uh, I, I, of course, will never forget Dr. Reaver came in to say that uh, if he hadn't been there before, he wouldn't have been able to find the tumor. Mm. I mean, it was just absolutely remarkable. Mm. You know, there was a little setback. It was, I was having digestive problems. My stomach wasn't working, uh, whatever the technical term for that might be. So I didn't eat or drink for about three months. Uh, however, there was uh, about three months later, food, glorious food. Everything turned around as Dr. Reaver predicted that it would. Uh, so uh, that's the long and short of it. The wonderful thing is that I had tolerated the, uh, the chemotherapy protocol so well that a second round was possible. Uh, so I think as, as Dr. Isakoff put it, uh, anything that got away, we're going to get this time. And there's my story. Hi, I'm here as a caregiver. Uh, my husband, Mark, is an 11-year survivor of pancreatic cancer. He remains in complete remission. Mark's disease progression began with pancreatitis attacks in 1992. Recurring bouts, bouts of acute pancreatitis increased in frequency over the next 15 years. He had hospitalizations dozens and dozens of times. In April 2007, he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And in December 2007, Mark was diagnosed with interpapillary mucinous neoplasm and was referred to Dr. Reber, who advised that the IPMN would likely develop into adenocarcinoma and recommended total pancreatectomy without delay. My husband had some big things coming up at work, and he said, let's just put this off for a few months. And Dr. Reber said, you will take the next operating room that's available. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the sudden uh, onsets of pancreatitis attacks were stressful, as we just didn't know when or where those attacks would occur during a birthday party, a wedding, a camping trip. Uh, so when Mark was scheduled for uh, surgery to remove his pancreas, in a way it was a real relief because we knew the days of those pancreatitis attacks were over. In February 2008, Dr. Reber removed the entire pancreas, spleen, gallbladder, and part of the duodenum in a surgery at UCLA that took 10 hours. We learned 28 days after surgery that Mark had pancreatic cancer. So I didn't really understand at that point that he still had risk. So I was just relieved to have the pancreas out. We chose a surgeon who was extremely experienced in the surgery, and I am convinced that made all the difference. You don't want someone to practice on you. Mark finished chemo and radiation in the summer of 2008. So I want to talk a little bit about my emotions at surgery. Um, at that point, for me, there was no time to be emotional. I was in crisis management mode, and that was it. Mark had surgery two days after I lost my job in a layoff. Our son was a junior in college, and our daughter was a junior in high school. I stayed in Mark's room at UCLA Hospital while he recovered and made sure that myself or a family member was with him 24-7. We kept a journal in the hospital, and I'd make that recommendation to anyone who's going to go through this situation. That way, you don't have to keep telling the story over and over and over and over again, which is therapeutic in the beginning, 
but on the 20th telling, it's exhausting. A few months after Mark was discharged, he started chemotherapy, then he started radiation, and then a second round of chemo, which he finished the summer of 2008, about seven months after surgery. Five days after Mark came home from the hospital having surgery, I started a new job, so it was pretty overwhelming. Our high school daughter, without our help, contacted her high school guidance counselor and uh, arranged to have a counselor come in and talk to her about how she was doing and managing her emotions. She had the whole thing set up. We didn't know anything about that until I had to sign a consent for someone to treat a minor. Our son stayed in his room most of the time um, and recently told me that he was really freaked out in the beginning, but once he saw that his dad wasn't overwhelmed and wasn't scared about this whole thing, he just let it go and he wasn't afraid either. So I had to survive this, I had some very close friends who took Mark to chemo and to radiation appointments uh, most of the time. We had a really strong support group through our church and it was really important for me to jo join an online support group for people who had total pancreatectomies so that I felt like I wasn't alone in the world and I could talk to people online about uh, what they were going through. And I really realized through that process that a lot of people had things a lot worse than we did and were really struggling. Some people couldn't leave their home for years, just had to stay too close to the bathroom. So um, that'd be, uh, that's pretty much my story. Okay, okay well, um, I'm sorry, Hammers, like it says here. Um, I'm married to Wendy Hammers. Most of you have met her somewhere along the line. Um, I'm not sure I did the homework right because I, I, um, I realize as I read, read my notes here, I've essentially written a piece about how much I love my wife. <laughs> so uh, did the homework exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah, and that's I think that's probably the the, the point of my little talk here. Um, you know, uh, but so before I kind of go into recounting it, um, as I started to write it all down, I, I realized I had to really think back because it's it's been a while, and that's wonderful. Um, there were there were times when I said to Wendy, like, can you imagine that there will be, there's going to come a day when this isn't the first thing we wake up thinking about, and it's not the first thing that people ask about when we when we go somewhere, uh, and that really has come to pass. So right now we've we've got a very happy ending on our on our hands here. Um, so uh, Wendy was July, uh, July of 2015. Um, Wendy was having quite a bit of pain. She was spending a couple hours on the floor of her office every day, not really knowing what it was about. And I said, "Why don't you go to the doctor and you know see what it is?" And she said, "Well, I you know I, I probably just got some bad sushi or something." And I said, oh, "Well, you could go to the doctor too." Um, and she said, "Well, I, maybe I pulled a muscle in yoga." Um, I said, "Well, you, or you know." I'm just going to do a juice cleanse. You know, I said, why don't you go to the doctor? Uh, <laughs> you know, she's not big on doctors. She's not big on Advil. You know. So um, she walked into my office and said, well, they, um, after having been to the doctor, she said, well, they, they found a mass in my pancreas. So my mind Im immediately goes to Michael Landon and Patrick Swayze and people we don't have anymore. Uh, you know, this from the girl that took me half my life to find. Um, so we went and met with uh, the wonderful Dr. Lee Rosen and um, um, Dr. Donahue, who's uh, my favorite person. Um, and they said, listen, you know, we don't, we can't necessarily say this to everyone, but the, po the, the plan here is that we fix you. You go back to your life. You know, um, we've caught this fairly caught it early, early enough. Um, so here's what we're going to do. So it was, uh, it was eight rounds of Fulfirinox. Um, and Wendy has a really colorful way of describing that. She said it was, uh, you know, because there's, there's, there's a take home thing, you know, it's, uh, they, they give you homework after your, your, uh, time in the chair in the, um, in the chemo lounge, as she called it. 
Um, and she said, it's like having a menage a trois with an asthmatic. <laughs> so we had this little lunchbox in between us that we go, <laughs> you know. She loved that part. Um, so from, from my, my perspective, nothing looked the same after, after this diagnosis. I go out into the world and, and the, the normalness of, of daily life of everybody else just looked weird to me. I go to the grocery store and I just go, look at the audacity of that butter just sitting on the shelf there, like nothing, like, like things aren't flying apart. How does it, you know, how can that butter just sit there? I go to the Bed Bath & Beyond, it took me 20 minutes to pick out a mop. Uh, because, you know, everything's different, you know. Um, but, you know, just walking down the street, I would think, I remember when I used to walk down the street and not have a care in the world. You know, now it's, everything's different. But at the same time, I thought about what's it going to be like afterwards when this is a story we can tell about something that happened a long time ago. Um, Wendy's positivity was a, a huge, huge source of strength for me um, because there's a, there's a tendency to think about Michael Landon and people we don't have anymore and go to the internet and start looking at numbers. Uh, Wendy transcended all of that. Um, and her positivity wasn't just, well, I'm, you know, I'm trying to think positively and, you know, yeah. It, it was, it, it was so not that. It was just that there was no negative side. There was nothing to, for her to turn her back on. You know, there wasn't a road to not take. It was just, I've got this and this is how we're going to do it. And it, there's, there's no, there's no, no other option. Um, real positivity. It was, it was a, uh. Uh, it was a real lesson for me, and I, I took a cue from, from that. <laughs> um, uh, so after those eight chemos, um, Dr. Donahue did a Whipple surgery, and she, Wendy said, do you think you can love a girl with half a pancreas? That's not what you signed up for. And I said, uh, I, I, I think I can do that, you know. Um, and I said, and I, I will kiss that scar every day. Don't, don't worry about the scar, please. Uh, so the day of the surgery, Dr. Dr. Donahue called from, you know, the side of the ER once he was all closed up and done, and he said he could not have, he could not be happier with how it went. He was beyond pleased. And uh, I, I like Dr. Donahue, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a few months later, when she had her strength back, four more chemos, and she really didn't want to do those chemos. Those last four were rough particularly the last two. And she thought, haven't I, you know, don't I have clear margins? Am I good? And Dr. Rosen, of course, was like, you'll do them. You're going to be fine. You know, and she did. Um, and her vibrancy came right back, uh, as did her hair, her skin tone, the feeling in her toes. It all eventually came back. Um, I had it really, I had it easy as a caregiver because Wendy was so wonderfully positive, as I already said. Um, I didn't have to be the lead cheerleader. She, she uh, you know, I didn't have to rally her up. She was already there. And I firmly believe that's why she's still here. Yeah. Uh, so on the caregiver side, lots of good hugs from people. Um, the casserole brigade was wonderful. <laughs> the bottles of water, the magazines, the visits, all of it. Um, the community is, is so important. Um, so uh, I've gotten a little out of order here, but on May 12th, 2016, Wendy um, was given the all clear. <laughs> oh. Okay, so... This is, this is out in front at 20th and um, Santa Monica. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see Wendy's feet there. Her feet are not touching the ground <laughs> by about this much. And it looks like she's levitating. Um, and that's... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, laughter 
played a huge part as well. As you know, as some of you may know, Wendy's a comedian and has been for 35 years. Um, some comedian friends of Wendy's gave a, uh, or put on a, a fundraiser. Um, uh, who came? Uh, Paul Reiser, Elaine Boozler, we're at the Comedy and Magic Club. And Wendy did not take any pain medication for the next four days after that. So, you know, it's, it laughed, it's not one of those little conversation things like, oh, you know, laughter. It, it works. It absolutely works. I have a front row seat to that. Um, you've got to have a great team, great team of doctors, people who, uh, people who meet offline. So when they come to you, they're confident. They know exactly what they're doing because they've talked about it in a Thursday morning meeting. They know exactly what you're all about your case. Everybody's weighed in. Uh, the people at UCLA were absolutely wonderful. Um, and as Augie said um, on the video for last year, um, if you're in this room, you're family. And you are. The, the people here are absolutely wonderful. And, you know, Wendy and I have a great new family. Uh, and it works. It's working. Well, we, we love Amy. <laughs> we love Amy Reese. Uh, when you take all of that together, it, it really does work. And more and more, and I, I know Aggie was saying earlier today that you, know, you guys started with 20 people. You know, there are a lot of people in this room. There are a lot of survivors. This is working. And um, you know, I, aren't, aren't I lucky for that? So that's essentially the Wendy and Garth story. Thanks. So nice. Okay, my name is Nancy Nebenzahl, and I was diagnosed in 2011 in August. I also had jaundice um, issues. I had skin that was itching like I've never felt in my life. I couldn't even put enough cream on to satisfy that situation. Um, I had uh, yellow in my eyes, my skin did turn yellow, and um, I had bowels that were not the right color, and urine also too, and I just didn't feel right. Um, I went to my internist right away on a Monday morning at nine o'clock. Uh, I, I gave him the symptoms. I said, I think I'm jaundice, or I'm not sure. He said, I will run blood tests, and I'll run it stat and I'll let you know. Well, by 11 o'clock, his secretary called and had me scheduled for a um, PET scan and a CT scan that afternoon at Cedars. That's pretty fast. Uh, I had the scans, and then the next day, no, I think it was Tuesday, that, okay, that was Monday. Tuesday, I was scheduled to see my gastroenterologist. And he said, Nancy, it's either a tumor or a stone. I'm not quite sure. So I've scheduled you tomorrow, which is Wednesday, to have a procedure with a wonderful Indian doctor. He was just lovely. Um, to have a, bile, a stent put down in my bile duct to open it up. And also um, to take a... Um, segment of the tumor to send it to biopsy. He said, but I'm pretty sure it's pancreatic cancer. How much have they told you? I said, they haven't told me anything. And at that point, I looked at my husband and I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry this is happening. And I said, this is the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing. I never dreamed. So I turned to the doctor and I said, I put myself in your hands and in God's. And at that moment, I let go. I totally let go because I knew this was something bigger than I ever, ever could control in my life. And so I went in to that procedure. And from that moment on, I just did the very thing. I let go. I found that spiritual element in my life. And to this day, I live with it every single day by meditation by reading things that are very inspirational, by going for walks in nature and seeing all the goodness that's in this world and that we can have and appreciate, really live with that appreciation rather than complaining about things and seeing the negative and everything. 
There is no negative in anything. <laughs> Everything's pretty good. So um, let me just see where we are. OK, so the pathology came back. I said to the, the Indian doctor, I said, well, can I have surgery? And he said, it depends. Depends on the location. So the pathology came back, and it was positive. It came back very quickly. And um, I went to see a surgeon recommended by my gastroenterologist at Cedars, Dr. Nick Nissen. And three weeks later, September 6th, I had my Weppel. So it was from diagnosis to surgery three weeks. I mean, things moved very quickly for me. I had the surgery, um, and um, the recovery, it was, it was okay. The recovery was okay. I did get an abscess in the incision site, which I had to deal with, with vancomycin. And, um, and I remember tears when I saw Dr. Nissen, and I started to cry, and I said, you know, I'm ready to go with treatment or do whatever I have to do, but now I'm stopped by this. You know, it was like stopped in my tracks right away. And so um, I, uh, oh, oh yeah, the, the other thing was, Dr. Nissen took a, um, a scan, ultrasound of my liver the morning of the surgery, and he said, now if anything's in your liver, I can't do the surgery. And it was clean. But two months later, after actually one month later, after the surgery, on a scan, there were lesions in my liver. So it had metastasized to my liver. And Dr. Isakoff felt that it probably was there, maybe too early to detect. So when they did the pathology on, from the Whipple, I had lymph node metastasis and liver metastasis. Quite a challenge, right? Quite a challenge. But we did it. <laughs> so <laughs> I saw Dr. Isakoff, and um, we started chemo in December. And the reason, I think, was because I really was trying to get strong enough after the surgery, and actually I had gone down to 85 pounds. Pretty thin. And everything people told me to eat, like milkshakes and all this stuff. I mean, after a Whipple, uh-uh, uh-uh. You, you just can't. I mean, everything was just so hard, so, so hard. So I started chemotherapy. We started in December 2011. And Dr. Isaacoff said, well, we got to make you stronger to do the chemotherapy. So I went on this TPN, which is a bag of food at night, 2,000 extra calories, which would go all the way around the clock, you know, at nighttime, in addition to the calories I ate during the day. And it made me stronger. And I got through the treatment. Four months into the treatment, I had a scan. And it showed that the lesions in the liver were multiplying and getting bigger. And I was devastated, devastated. So, Dr. Isaacoff said, we're going to change the treatment. I said, how do you know it's going to work? He said, it will work. And he put me on um, mycom uh, mitomycin. mitomycin. It's three treatments, an infusion. It's, it's, it's spaced out, like maybe six weeks apart. And um, I had to go on four blood pressure medications at one time. But you know, the, the thing is that you do what you have to do. You look, you look adversity in the face of it and say, OK, how can I get through this? And I always say every day, what can I do? What can I do? How can I do? How can I participate? So we started with diet. And I only eat nutritiously. I mean, I just do. I got the Cancer Fighting Cookbook from Amazon. It will tell you every food, the properties of every food, what it does to your body, and there are great recipes in there. And I just, it's the way I love to eat. It's the way I prefer to eat. It works for me, and to this day, I still am. Um, I also do Qigong twice a week. I do Pilates. 
But again, I agree with someone, uh, well, the nutritionist who said, and also um, uh, somebody else this morning, that good sleep, good water, nutritious food, I eat organic, um, and um, positive attitude, being happy, surrounding yourself with love and with friends, and I have an amazing family, supportive, loving. They would do anything for me, and we would do anything for them. And it's so important to feel loved and not feel... Um, you, you want to just be, you want to feel safe and you want to feel okay, no matter what, no matter what. So I finished chemotherapy in um, 2012, so it was about nine months. And it wasn't all that time because, you know, your platelets go down, your red blood cells go down, I'd have transfusions, whatever I needed, I took. Because my feeling was, when I went to chemo, I'd play my Frank Sinatra music, and my feeling was, this treatment is going to help me, it's going to heal me. And I took it in, and I made it a part of myself, and um, that's my journey. To this day, I, I live pretty dis a disciplined life, pretty much. I still do what I do. It works for me. It feels good to me. I, don't, uh, I try not to do things that I really don't want to do because <laughs> life is too short and you might as well enjoy yourself when you're doing it. So um, I think I've covered everything. Let me see. Uh, I think, what, what? Okay, the results of my last scan were good. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Dr. Isaacoff is sitting up here in front, and yes. he certainly, yeah. his name has been mentioned more than one time today. I just want to say publicly to Dr. Isaacoff, thank you, thank you for everything you did for me, for being my friend, and for being in our lives. And I also want to say thank you to my family, who mean everything to me, and I really, couldn't have gotten through without their support. Now we have a half an hour um, for questions or comments from you all, um, or from any additional comments from the panel. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question? Would you go to the microphone, make a comment? Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Leslie, and my father is a pancreatic um, cancer survivor. And I have a quick, first of all, thank you so much for sharing everything. And the thing that's really important is, A, we're in a community where we all, you know, it's a club we don't want to belong to, but we do, and thank God we have the support that we have. But everybody's experience is different. My father has, I asked him if it was okay if I asked this question, but... He has a symptom, and we can't say, it, it's somehow direct, directly um, caused by pancreatic cancer, but it started after his ripple. He had um, successful chemotherapy, he had a successful um, surgery, and then he had two years post-op of no treatment, living great, and now he's in treatment again. But his body doesn't regulate his, his um, temperature. You know, he gets, yeah, he gets very cold very, very easily. And after the surgery, once in a while, he would get these shivering bouts that were uncontrollable. I mean, just like it would knock him out. And it, it happened after the surgery, and now that he's going through chemo again, of course his weight is lower, he's not as hydrated, but it's happening much more often, and they are significant. He can feel them coming on, he starts trembling, he tries to get in bed and do everything he can to help as quickly as possible, but his breathing becomes labored, he, he can barely speak. It's, a, it's scary if you've never seen it. We've never heard of anybody else experiencing this, so my question is for anybody on the panel or in this room, has anybody else experienced that as a side effect from pancreatic cancer? And if so, what did you do? 
or what would you do? I thought Lee was going to answer that question. <laughs> It's impossible to really tell you exactly what's wrong. I can tell you that there are changes. People uh, have symptoms of all sorts of different kinds after major surgery. Um, the one that you described is not typically one that's seen after a Whipple operation. It makes me wonder whether it isn't related to low blood sugar uh, because the operation of a Whipple certainly changes the absorption of the foods that we eat and sometimes low blood sugars can occur. Um, but I don't, I obviously don't know. So I, I suppose you've done what I'm about to say you should do and that is to go to a, a good internist and have somebody uh, look very carefully at all the things that a, a good internal medicine doctor or gastroenterologist or endocrinologist would look at. But beyond that, I really can't say very much about it. It's an unusual symptom. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, for those of us who have loved ones or have, you know, been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, at what point did you stop thinking, why is this happening to me or why now or why in general and start thinking about like, you know, this is how we're going to get through this and like no matter what, we all just have each other. Like what was your personal experience with that? Um, uh, you know, for me, the first thing is, why not me? Uh, these things happen in the world, and that, that's literally, I, I had no more thought about it than that. Uh, it's the dealing with it, and uh, you, you've heard all the positivity here on the panel, and that's what the patient has to do. Uh, the, the thing that, uh, that f for instance, Dr. Reaver and Dr. Isaacoff offered to me was hope, and w with hope, you, you can build, you can build from there. Uh, it's, it's very important to be selfish at that point. Think, think of yourself and what you need, and in doing that, you're going to help create an environment around you that's going to help you begin to heal. Next case. I don't know what, how long it's been or what stage you're in right now, but I can tell you that when my husband was going through chemo and radiation and then chemo, it was really difficult uh, for all of us. Um, my overwhelming emotion was guilt, not wondering why this is happening to me, because like Lee said, um, you know, why not? It can happen to anyone. But he was needing me to be at home, and I had to be at work. Uh, I wasn't sure if he was going to make it. I wasn't sure if my income was going to have to put our kids through college and support our family. But what I can tell you is that after that kind of a long, long six to nine months of feeling horrible where he was so irritable seeing dust bunnies under the couch uh, when he was just laying there, uh, you know, watching Food Network or something. And just being really upset about any little thing, understandably, because he felt horrible. Um, but once we got through that, it got a lot better. And at that point, then you can look forward to those little steps of feeling the breeze on your face and being able to appreciate it and, uh, you know, going on things. I can tell you we hiked the John Muir, three segments of the John Muir Trail, within several years after his surgery. Uh, he's 11 year survivor. We're going to Peru in a few months. We're gonna stay in a tree house in the Amazon jungle. Nice. You know, so there, life does change. It does get better. I had to Google, how do you keep insulin cool in the Amazon jungle? And I got an answer. <laughs> so I think you have to try to kind of try to get out of that this is how I feel right now, and it's a hopeless feeling, knowing that those feelings are temporary. And it's not going to be this way forever. It's a journey. You're going to have your 
hills that you're climbing up and your valleys that you're in, and it's going to change. So, you know, I just you just have to kind of hold on to that hope and get through each day, day to day. Um, the other suggestion I would make is when you're going through that situation, what I found is people asking me, how's Mark? Is he going to get better? Is he going to die? <laughs> Those kinds of questions over and over and over again were really, uh, would drag me down. So I would suggest if that you feel that happening to you, tell everybody, call my phone. I don't pick it up. I have an update on my answering machine with what the status is, and that way they can get the information that they need, and you don't have to say it over and over and over again, drink, bringing yourself down. Yeah. Right. Are there, yes. Others, go ahead. Okay, I'd like to add something as well. Um, oops. <laughs> um, yeah. I was remiss in not mentioning the fact that I was I have been going to and for a long time before my diagnosis going to very lucky to know a doctor who helped me through this process but I remember going to him when I was diagnosed and I I went through all that why me and you know doing this uh, a self self pity thing, and he said, "Okay, Nancy, you've got five minutes for that, and then that's enough. We have to muster all your energy, all your strength, all your focus to go where you need to go, and that's forward. So it really, it's okay. We all do it, but don't spend a lot of time there because it's not helpful, and it really you need you need to find the courage and the strength." to move forward with, 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 with the work that's going to cure you and help you. And there's a lot of work. And it's not the work that's just done to you, but it's the work that's the internal work as well. It's your own psyche and strength that you have to find. Anyway. Garth, did you want to say something? Or did well, uh, um, as for us, there there was never. I, I don't remember a moment of why why you never said why me. I never said why us, and it was never like well, it was that irresponsible lifestyle. You know, it was you don't have an irresponsible lifestyle, so there's nothing to point at and go well. If only you hadn't, you know, it might be that and there wasn't anything. So you know, the the, the why me thing was is is just useless. Um, you know, it, there's there's so much to. Uh, it's just that that's what the road ahead is, period. You know, and thinking about it not being that way is not super useful. So, you know, and you used to talk about your attitude. I love the way you say it, you know. So, you know, I think a positive attitude's working for me. If, you know, if people said, you know, having a terrible attitude might work, you know, I'd try it. But I really don't think it's going <laughs> to, really don't think that's the way to go. Um, you know, and I think we all play that out. Like, oh, if I'd left, you know, and a half a second later, I wouldn't have gotten a ticket this morning, you know? Like, well, you can play that game, you know, and you can, there's actually more to think about there than, than being diagnosed with something like this. You just, that's the road ahead, and you just do it. And it's, and here we are. I, I'll say a bit about it. Uh, Dr. Reber just turned to me and said, people are different. And that's absolutely true. And from our research and others' research, I can tell you that actually lots of people do ask why me. Uh, and it's a, it's a very natural question. You know, why would something this terrible happen to me? Mm -hmm. And the very hard part about that is when you do ask that question is sometimes people come to, there must have been something bad about me. I must have deserved this in some, in some way. I wasn't good enough or religious enough or worked hard enough or did, ate the right things or those sorts of things. And those are the times when that kind of question can really hurt. Yeah. Um, there is nothing about you that created this disease and nothing about your family. There are risk factors 
but it's not like you intentionally, you know, took part in risk factors and think, thought, oh, you know, I'm going to bring this cancer on myself. That just, it, it's just not true. And sometimes you have to keep saying that to yourself. This is not about anything that's been wrong with me. Now, that's not to say you don't want to, you know, have, uh, eat the right foods and exercise and those sorts of things. Those sorts of things contribute to both a longer and a, and a happier quality of life. So it's not that you don't want to change your behaviors if you need to, but the why me is a question that often people ask, and it's simply not something about something you did wrong. Um, Sometimes those thoughts, the, que the other question you asked was, you know, when do you, when do you get over that? One thing that you can do sometimes, and one of you said, you know, the day when you wake up and it's not in your head, that's an amazing day. And sometimes you need a place to put that worry and that profound thinking. There, I think it's a Peruvian tradition there's something called, I believe, Peruvian worry dolls. And they're wonderful things. You can pick them up at a Peruvian store. And they're little, uh, little nicely woven bags of these little tiny dolls. And what you get to do with them is every day, if you need to, you take one out. There are often five of them or something like that. You take one out and say, this is my worry. This is what I'm thinking about cancer today. This is what I'm feeling. And then you put it back in. And you take the next out and you say, and you know what, I'm feeling this too. I feel rage that this happened to me. And you put it back in. And you do that and then you close up the bag and put it someplace safe for the next time when you need to take it out. And that might be in a few hours or it might be in a day or it might be in a month. There Sometimes you need a place for whatever you're feeling about it. And it could be Peruvian worry dolls, it can be talking to loved ones, it can be writing in a journal. Sometimes you just need a place for that. And as Debbie said, it, it does get better. It does get better as long as you make a place for it and you have hopefully the kind of support, it does get better. And it doesn't mean necessarily that the disease will be cured Healing is not the same thing as cure. You can heal without your disease being cured. That's big. And sometimes it takes working toward healing, no matter what your disease is doing. So that's, that's a good people one. are different. That's a great comment. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good takeaway right there, I think. It was, that was a good thing. Another question. Not a question. I just want to make a statement. Thank you. I have cancer, but cancer does not have me. <laughs> to God be the glory. That's all I want to say. Yeah. Uh, 16 years ago, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I met two of my heroes, they're right here, Dr. Reber and Dr. Isakoff. It's been quite a journey. It metastasized after a year, well, it had already gone in my, into my lymph nodes, but it metastasized after a year, went into my lungs and chest cavity, and that man, Isakoff, he wouldn't give up on me. <laughs> and, and I became allergic to some of the treatments, and he would switch me to something else. And I really praise God. One of the things that I like the most about uh, Dr. Isakoff is he told me to get on with my life. For three years, I worked. And I had to uh, drive and fly all over the United States. And he worked up a pump so I could keep going. And, you know, I'd get my infusion every 10 minutes. Um, but I also, uh, after D Dr. Reber did the surgery, it was nine hours, but he did a wonderful job. I didn't really have any problems with it. In a month and a half, I flew to um, 
uh, Scotland for my son's wedding. He was there getting a PhD in Scotland. And uh, shortly after that, I got on to chemo with uh, Dr. Isakoff, but then my husband had been asked to uh, speak at a commencement in Africa, so we flew to Africa. So I continued to live my life. Like I say, I was on chemotherapy six years because it had come back. And uh, I have been clear, I think, for five or six years. Uh, they haven't found anything. The thing nice. <laughs> the things that worked for me is I'm a woman of prayer. And this might work for some of you who are also people of faith. Every night, I'd ask the angels to come by my bed so I didn't worry during the night. During the daytime, I would watch reruns of I Love Lucy and laugh and laugh, <laughs> and that really helped too. I had a very supportive husband. My whole family is very supportive, but I praise God, and I want to say these two men, and I've heard of some other wonderful doctors here, I really am so thankful for what they have done for me. Yeah. Hi, I'm Frank. Um, I just want to say the thing that you brought up a couple times is, is like feeling support, like family and friends, this kind of thing. Um, I'm in a bunch of 12-step programs, and I just want to say that my support group, when I first got diagnosed and I found a cancer support group, and I'm sitting there, a lot of the facilitators looked at me and said, Frank, a lot of people come in here and they're so angry or they're so depressed or they're just like, you know, why me questions like that. And they, they looked at me and they said, you're not angry and you're not depressed. What's going on? And I said, because I'm not sitting here by myself. And I think this is one of the things, I don't know if you have family or friends, you can make family and friends here, right? And you, can, you don't have to do this by yourself. And I just say that that's the best way I know how to heal. I don't know if I ever get cured, but I know I can heal that way, so thank you. I just want to add one more thing. Love, love has been proven. It is one of the greatest healers possible. Yeah. Hi, my name's Daniela. And I was really shy to stand up here, but everyone's so brave, so I thought, be brave and <laughs> get up to the microphone. Dr. Reber, I saw you about three and a half years ago. I have a cystic adenoma, which is um, apparently not cancer, but a benign, extremely large tumor in my pancreas. And um, at the time, you said, don't do anything now, have it checked, you know, but if you can't live it, with it. So I continue to have MRIs, and as it's slowly growing, I find I've got to get out of denial, find out more information. Um, and so I'm kind of between that place of a Whipple, because it would still take a Whipple for it to come out, and it's very large, or continuing like this. Um, I guess my question, and maybe the panel can answer, is I'd like to know more about um, what you go through after the Whipple. Someone talked about a Whipple attack. I don't know what that is. And I don't mean to bring up negative things, but I'd like to just understand the process a little bit, if that's OK. Hmm. Um, not that I'm the most knowledgeable on this. I just started talking. So um, I, I've known several people who have had Whipples, and the, uh, the post-op is, is seemingly different for everyone. I have a, a, a dear friend in the Dallas area who uh, was just a couple of weeks one side or the other of where Wendy was, um, and um, he didn't get out of the hospital for like 31 days or something. You know, they won't let you out until you're on solid food again. But uh, he had his own set of complications, whatever it was. And, you know, but, and that's by far the longest time I've ever heard anybody stayed in the hospital after a Whipple. Wendy, uh, you know, Dr. Donahue came in somewhere like day four and said, you know, this building is for sick people. You're, you're going to have to go home now, <laughs> you know. Um, seriously, she was like, what, what were you, like, was it six days? Six days. Okay, so then she came home and, you know, it's, it's been 
it's been great. Uh, you know, my, my friend in Dallas said his, his oncologist told him it's not a matter of when you become diabetic after, or, or if you become diabetic after a Whipple, it's when. And when, Wendy's never been anywhere n near being diabetic. So it, it's, there are many schools of thought. There are, ev everyone is on their own path. Hmm? No, yeah, it's, it, you know, so, so uh, the, the diabetic thing is not, is, A doesn't follow B there necessarily. Um, you, you're, you're with the right group of people. So that's the biggest step you can take forward. Um, uh, w Wendy takes Creon, which is a, you know, a, a, a enzyme replacement. Just every time she eats, she has to take one of these little capsules. Looks like an old contact, you know, with the little dots in, in there. And, and that's it. Essentially, uh, so things can go very, very well following a Whipple. Yeah, well, let me begin by saying uh, you get a world-class scar. <laughs> and it really is one that your friends will admire. Uh, and you join a, a very select group. Uh, the, um, it, it's been almost 18 years since my Whipple surgery. And as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, there was a series of three operations, and I didn't eat for three months. Uh, humans are infinitely adaptable. Uh, I mean, we really are. We're so resilient. Uh, and I would like to regard the young lady that, that asked earlier about what we do. Uh, it's really just one little step at a time, as, as has been said. It's not an A to B process. Uh, what my wife and I found a lot of consolation of is simply the idea of things moving in the right direction. You know, that, that would be enough, just a little day-to-day -day things that improve. But back to your question about the, the resection, um, it took probably like two years from, from the beginning of all of this to, uh, uh, to the end for things to truly be normal. Uh, I, I think that in your situation, you need less time. But at this point, I eat everything that I like. I drink everything that I like. My life is uh, very normal. Of course, Creon is, uh, it can be important. It certainly is to me. But uh, I'm, I live an absolutely normal life. Yeah. Just for one minute, um, Dr. Lee had a pie chart that said 30% of uh, I would say disease process is genetic, and the 70% is in our control. Uh, and the 70% includes the love, the spiritual spirituality, meditation, exercise, and diet. And that's really true. Um, that is in our control. In 2009, the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology was awarded to Elizabeth Blackburn. And she discovered something called telomeres, and that if you want cells to be healthy, you need healthy telomeres. And she began studying these in a lot of, she actually just had a book out, uh, what results in healthy telomeres. And she came up with, after a lot of research, mental attitude, exercise, and diet. So this is scientific proof that the other 70% is truly in your control. Big, yes. I, I think that those are great final words, and I'm sure that, that we can talk to each other more if you'd like to. Uh, please do complete your evaluations because they're very important for the next symposium. And I'm going to leave the true last words to our leader, Aggie Hirschberg. This was truly, 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 truly a great day. I'm not crying anymore because the day was so positive, so mm. I stopped crying. Um, I thank all the speakers. I'm going to give them a little bag of, of saying thank you for sharing. It's important for all of us to hear everybody's words. And uh, see you next year. Yeah. <laughs> and don't forget the summer barbecue, my house. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you.